Time to say hello and happy new year to John Shannon, the former executive producer of Hockey Night in Canada and the co-host of the Bob McCowan, Bob McCowan podcast. Welcome back in 2024, John. Hi, boys. How are you? You know, your batteries are regenerated. You're ready to go, mm-hmm. recharged. Yeah, not bad. absolutely. Except we're having a huge debate here on the West Coast, John. Maybe you can help settle it as a native British Columbian. Let me, let me, hold on. Let me guess. Pedersen worth more or less than Nylander? Is that, is no, that... <laughs> no. One would think. We're having that debate too, but should the parade go down Berard or Georgia? What says you? You know, I tell you what, I'm still I'm still a Georgia guy. You know, I, I think anything that, you know, you, you, you start at Stanley Park and you can go all the way down to the arena. I mean, I, that's that's what I would do. And it, then has get, it has the yeah. breath. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It has the breath. Yeah, it's got, you know, it's got great breath. It gets to Stanley Park. When I was yeah. a kid, Georgia Street was Vancouver. Right. You know, that's where it was. It was Georgia Street. It wasn't, mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't Burrard. Mind you, you could probably have it out in Surrey and be just as successful. That's now. true. King well, George Highway. The, the one thing I would say, though, if it does go Georgia, how are you getting up and down from Rogers Arena? If you do Burrard and you just fly, you can make your way down Pacific. Well, you, no, it's on Georgia. The rink's on Georgia. Yeah, but via Viaduct. Exactly. Yeah, Thank Viaduct. You. The Thank Viaducts. You, yeah, the via. Yeah. Where are the cars coming from? Are they they from the to- Costco parking lot. <laughs> no, no. I, well, as long as you get one, listen. I'll tell you what, I have the moment you mentioned Costco and Vancouver, uh, you can't help but remember back to the to the 2010 Olympics. Yes. <laughs> every one of us, every one of us, we spent all day in that damn arena. But you know, at lunchtime, we walked across to get our dollar fifty hot dogs. It was fantastic. Absolutely. It sure was. Um, our poll question today: are you now expecting playoff success? We're nearly halfway through the season here, John. In fact, they play game 41 Tuesday against the Islanders. First half of the season, or first 20 games, first quarter, 13, 6, and 1. Second quarter, 13, 5, and 2. They actually got better in this second 20 game segment. So, have they changed expectations for you in terms of the playoffs, the Stanley Cup playoffs? Not yet, but it's getting there. Um, you know, it, the, the problem becomes. If they do get eliminated in the, in an early round, people could say, well, learning curve, learning how to win, learning yeah. how to lose. Um, you know, should this team go a distance now? Yeah, they should. But I, I'm not holding my breath that it happens. Um, you know, there are weathered teams in the Western Conference that are playing an 82-game exhibition schedule. Colorado and Vegas. They have been through the trials and tribulations of having great seasons and being eliminated. They've also had gone through the trials and tribulations and won championships. They know how to pace themselves. As much as the Canucks have what they've done is magnificent, it, it is truly one of the great stories in hockey this year. Um, pacing yourself to be ready for the middle of April is something that teams don't necessarily plan to do all the time. Colorado and Vegas aren't panic um, of what the way they're playing. In fact, Colorado's played pretty damn well. But yeah. I think the Canucks are. Uh, I think the Canucks are in a position of making sure they still have to prove themselves before we get to the postseason. What if I told you they could win the Pacific and get one of the wild cards and avoid that two-three matchup in the Pacific? <laughs> One of their wild cards, the Edmonton Oilers. <laughs> mm, potentially, at this rate, though, they could catch third. Well, well, then you're going to get the LA Kings, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, you know that's that's a challenge too. The, all of a sudden, you know, from you know being the ugly duckling of the division, the Pacific Division has become really, really, really hard. In fact, well, it's I mean that's a that's a silly thing to say in many ways because every division right now is unbelievably difficult. The challenge of the 16 teams, the eight teams in the in the in the Western Conference. There are going to be good teams, we know that, eliminated in the first round. That's just a fact of life in the National Hockey League when you have, you know, um, I, I, th- I think there are 22 or 23 vile teams in this league right now. And that's the real challenge of what's going on for the Canucks and what will go on for all the teams once we get to the Stanley Cup playoffs. It's a good show. I mean, in the Western Conference, uh, oh. the teams that are in playoff positions as we speak 
Um, I don't think the Predators can win the Cup. And I doubt the Stars do, but I wouldn't. I mean, can they go on a storybook run with some great goaltending? Absolutely. It's really seven of eight teams, I would say, in the Western Conference have the ability to win a few rounds. Jay Godinger has to be better, yeah. you know, and he has to be healthy for one thing. Jay Godinger has to be better. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, you know, when you look at both, both conferences that, that way, I mean, it is nuts. I mean, but nobody would have predicted the Canucks doing this. Nobody would have predicted Winnipeg doing this. Um, it's the breaths of share for Western Canada. That's for sure. Uh, and when, when you look at, you know, what's, what's supposed to happen and they, the Oilers, the Oilers are not going to be discounted now between now and the end of the regular season. I'll play, we've playfully kicked this around, but it, it, it now is the rubber's hitting the road for Canucks management now in that, uh, you know, they've got some salary issues going forward after this season. We've talked, again, sort of playfully, oh, it's kind of like a one-year window if you wanted to go all in. How tempted is Canuck management now, do you think, now that they've reached the halfway mark with no let up in the pace, to say, okay, maybe we do have to sacrifice some assets and kind of go mini all in for at least a year here. And they may take a half step back next year. This might be an opportunity, but it's a big risk because you're giving up assets that you know you want two, three, four years down the road here. And this is a management group that will be around to see those years. Well, all I do is I look at uh, the legacy that Jim Rutherford left in Carolina and what he left in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, when, when Jim – if you sat with Jim and in, in particular in Pittsburgh and said, are, are you going to try to win the cup every year? The answer was always, you know, you only have Sid Crosby and you only have Evgeny Malkin and Chris Letang for so many years. Um, you have to wonder if that conversation is occurring uh, at Rogers arena now with this core of guys, you know, it, it, you know, how many years are you going to have Pedersen like this? How many years is JT Miller going to be this way? You know, what about Quinn? You know, is is there a mentality to say we better strike when the iron's hot? We all, you know, we and I, and I was on this list too. I was on the on the well. You know, what are they doing out there? And then it just it seemed to turn on a dime, and the plan has come together. And so I think that if there's anybody in the National Hockey League that would put all his poker chips in, it would be Jim Rutherford. And, and I, would be less concerned about three years from now than he is for this season and perhaps to find a way to structure things to get through next season as well. You bring up a great point of the well, JT Miller front because JT Miller three years from now is not going to be the well, JT Miller. No, but the, the other thing is, is if, if there's one guy to push all in, it's Jim Rutherford. If there's a second guy to pull, push all in in the NHL, it's Francesco Aquilini because they were doing it with teams far worse than this. The JT Miller trade being prime example, the Oliver Ekman Larson trade being another yeah. example. So you know the owner's been impatient. He's been looking looking forward to this day. Well, the long, owner's impatient because he's a fan like everybody you know downtown. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the one thing that give give Francesco some credit and say you know at least he's passionate about his hockey team. And then you have to you know with that put the asterisk saying sometimes you're too passionate about your hockey. team. You know, so you can't. That's that's one you can't really win. This is this is all. Mm -hmm. This is all on Alvin and Rutherford. This is all on what those two guys will decide the fate of this franchise for the next couple of years. So then that begs the question: What do you think it takes to get Elias Lindholm out of Calgary? <laughs> um, is that who you want, really? Well, here's the thing, John. Um, he's reunited the lotto line here playing yes, Patterson and Miller. And if that's the case, then the big need on the club moves from winger for Patterson to, to a center. second line center. Yeah. yeah. See, I, I was on another show in Vancouver last week and I said, they need a second line center. And I got people saying you're wrong. They've mm -hmm. always known they need a second line center. They've known it for a long time in Vancouver. So um, I'm not sure it's Lindholm though. I'm just not sure. So I think you have to go and scour the other teams and some of the teams that are going to fall off of the uh, the face of the playoff earth and say, who who's out there? Who, who can we get? And and I don't have an answer for you right now on that. Uh, you know, as much as Lindholm has been a good player, uh, and the other thing is, I, at, at some point, Craig Conroy's got to stop turning with the team in the division. It really does. Mm. I just don't understand that one. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and this goes circles back to what you just said previously too, about 22 teams feeling like they probably have some sort of a chance. I mean, there's not a lot of trade partners out there right now, is there? No. And, and listen, I, they're up until this weekend, I thought Calgary was, was going to be a little closer. And then they, you know, they lose in Philadelphia, they lose in Chicago, which was, you know, they got beaten by Peter Mrazek, um, you know, with a team without Connor Bedard. Um, you know, that, that really hurt the flames and that, because the flames have been this, you know, we're not going to sign anybody until we know what really we have this year. We're not going to trade anybody or consider until we know whether we have a chance at the playoffs. And now you have to wonder really, um, if that thought process is different between ownership and management with the flames. Mm. Who's the bigger surprise this season, the Canucks or the Jets? Uh, well, I think the Canucks. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I, think I, we... I really, I really do. Yeah, uh, Winnipeg is Winnipeg is a great story, um, and I it, and I do I do do a lot of work in Winnipeg, and you see it firsthand that that this team is playing um, with a, a, a great deal of confidence now. Uh, but there's been a, and there's but there's been a giant shift in leadership there with the move to Adam Lowry, Connor Hellebuck, and Shifley committing stay long term are big big uh points for the for the jet but based on what we saw last year i i i think that what the canucks have done is is miraculous it, it really is um and particularly with some of the guys that you know w the, every pundit in, in, in on the lower mainland thought you know tyler myers is done never play another game as a canuck well, connor garland you know, yeah connor garland yeah i mean so They've done it. They've they've done it with pieces that people thought wouldn't exist in Vancouver, and I think that's an important thing to remember. Oh, I mean, I mean that that third line, which we're now calling the second line, um, you know, like Connor Garland couldn't make it work with every center they tried beside him. Who knew the solution would be Vegas's fifth line center, Teddy Bluker, <laughs> and then somehow that that line would erupt. The guys from not... Pittsburgh knew. The guys that from yeah. Pittsburgh knew that Teddy Bluger was a good player. Yeah, Teddy Bruger was Teddy Bruger was pretty banged up all last season, you know, and they knew mm -hmm. what what kind of player he was. Yeah, uh, although I'm not sure they thought he might be their second line center at the <laughs> midpoint of the season. That's that's where we're at last night. Hey, John, how about that game last night? Huh? Oh. The games at the Garden with two good teams like that, five on five for almost the entire beautiful game, beautiful yeah. goals, like beautiful goals. Last night, wow, I that brought what, me back. Vancouver, uh, most Canadian cities are great places to watch hockey games. Um, I don't think there's any place in North America as electric as Madison Square Garden. It mm. is, it is fantastic. The, I think I've told this story before. The, the five years that I spent in New York working at the NHL office. Um, at five o'clock, the whole office leaves, right? They, they go home, except for those of us that are actually hockey crazed. Uh, and at a quarter after seven, I would walk down from the office to the garden and walk up the elephant walk and go from the, you know, from ground zero to the, 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 you know, the street level to the ninth floor, um, or actually the fifth floor where the, where the Zamboni entrance to the ice is. And it is just electric in that building. Those fans are so passionate. The sounds and smells of Madison Square Garden are unlike any other in the National Hockey League. It, I, if, you, if you're a Canucks fan, if you're a hockey fan, go to the Garden. Go to New York for a holiday. Buy a ticket. It is fantastic. And they no love their Rangers. And they love their Rangers. And it is uh, it, it's fun. And listen, was there any doubt that the Canucks were a better team last night? No. Oh, my goodness gracious. And the Rangers have been touted for the last five and a half weeks as being the best team in the East. Although, you know, they've, they've hit a bit of a wall, but they've played very well. But the Canucks were by far the better team. They've been wondering about playoff Couple. tests. Did they pass a playoff test with, uh, with that one? Yeah, there's still a bit more. I mean, I still uh, you still have to – See what they they do on a on a basis in Boston, you know. I mean, it, it, I, I and I, I still worry about you know what's going to happen in the in the Western Conference first. Well, Vegas um, and LA too. They've got almost the entire season series versus both of those guys left. So uh, yeah, and 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 the Avs. 
You know, if if Georgiev can play the way he played at some point during the regular season with Ranton and McKinnon, McCarr, Taves, um, and they and they get some of their their bottom six guys like Miles Wood back, uh, I think the Avalanche are going to be scary before the playoffs start. So let me ask you this, because we're we've been having this debate as well, John. Is Lotto Line the best way to go in a Stanley Cup playoff best of seven series? Because it is kind of an eggs in one basket way to slice it. Would you be comfortable with their matchups lines two through four if they're sticking with the lot of line in a best of seven? Um, playoff hockey is different. Yeah. Playoff hockey is a different animal. Uh, if I know, if I'm coaching against Rick Pocket and I know he's going to put those three guys together for the, for the whole night, you know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to find a way to, challenge them every time and take my chances on my second line versus anything else the Canucks can throw at. So I, I, I do think that's why there's a need to, to add another center and to, to create a bit more balance, you know, and, and not to, I don't want to be part of a drinking game in Vancouver, but um, a lot of the success and change in Edmonton has because Leon Dreisaitl's line is now with Ryan McLeod um, and Warren Fogle is carrying a bit of the load. Uh, not everybody's, you know, with Nugent Hopkins and, uh, and Iman and McDavid. And so it changes the whole personality. If you have a second offensive line, and I think that if you look around the league, a second offensive line, look what happened has happened in Toronto with the growth of William Nylander and John Tavares and, and, uh, and Bertuzzi is the second line. It changes the personality of your team. And I think that, you know, the guys running the Canucks know exactly that. And that's why I think they're going to try to have to get something uh, for their second line to have you know, secondary scoring. Let's face yeah. it. That's going to be the key. Um, switching gears here. Why did Cutter Goche not want to be a Philadelphia flyer? I don't know. What, I, what I, did you I, make I, of the trade and the reaction in Philadelphia? Well, I, I, I'm a, uh, well, boy, tell you what, uh, I think you get a real sense that uh, Keith Jones and Danny Briere are, pro flyer and they're going to be, you know, speaking their minds. I thought that was an impressive uh, use of media last night in Philadelphia in so many ways with a press conference and an interview and say, Hey, he didn't want to be here. So we didn't want him in the end anyway. I mean, the fact that he wouldn't meet them in, in Gothenburg to me was, that was different. Something mm -hmm. obviously had happened um, at, at some point. Uh, but the Flyers, you know, the Flyers, to me, this is now a domino effect. I wonder how long Walker's going to be in the lineup now. Uh, if he's going to be moved, does that allow them to change, to trade another defenseman? If Drysdale stays healthy, he is a good player. But, you know, he hasn't been healthy for the three years. Um, you know, and Pat Verbeek can talk about, well, you know, it's, it's got nothing to do with the contract. I, I think there's a little bit of, of – uh, Anxiety when it came to what both Zeers and um, and Drysdale did to Pat Verbeek and the Ducks, so I think they were probably pleased to find a way to get another player. And and let's face it, the Ducks didn't need another defenseman. They got how many how many quality young defensemen do they have, and how many young, more quality young defensemen do they have coming up? You know, Zellweger will probably be up before the end of the season, and I think that, that they're going to be they're going to be something to talk about by the way, in about three years. <laughs> so that's, that's another reason for a team in the, in the Western conference to, you know, put all your cards on the table right now, rather than worrying about what happens three years from now. Yeah. So, the, I mean, they definitely need Zellweger and some combination of Hellas and Luna Warren uh, now to be uh, their right side guys going forward. Yeah. Um, but um, if, if they, if they are that, and of course we know they got the, uh, this Mitchikov kid has been so great on the left side, um, not to mention uh, some others. Well, and they're the going to get another good player in the next draft. They yes, are. yes, indeed. They're they going to get another one. Um, maybe, my last one. Maybe, maybe a Celebrini. What do you think? Uh, oh, boy, wow. Chicago's doing their best to try to get Celebrini. <laughs> and, of course, wow. uh, in San Jose, you have the Shark Tank for uh, Mac. One. We, we, before you, we, you mentioned it, before you go, we should talk to you about this. Elias Pettersson contract negotiation. You talked about Nylander uh, or made a reference to it off the top. Um, I mean, is it weird to you that it doesn't sound like no matter what the offer is that Pettersson is willing to, to sign in season, it sounds like 
you could back up the Brinks truck and they're still going to say, we're going to talk after the season is over. Is there any red flag for you there? No, not really. I, 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 no, let's remember um, relationships. You know, this is such still a business of relationships. Um, and, and, you know, Elias and his agent and Rutherford have a great, have a great path of communication. I, I'm, I'm not panicked at all. You know, I, you know, I, and I think the two guys that uh, probably popped champagne yesterday were Elias Patterson and Leon Dreisaitl. You know, good money, and 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 believe it or not, perhaps both the Canucks and Oilers popped a bit of champagne too, because maybe that price was a little lower than the, what they expected. They had to sign their guys for. It's it's a fat. It, this could be a win-win for player and teams by the end of the discussion of both guys resigning with their clubs. Hey, just lastly, uh, apparently Steve Steos is getting impatient in Ottawa and might be looking to make some moves there. And they are one of the few teams in with their games in hand that are likely out of it. Now, do, do you see some activity there in the nation's capital and some bigger names moving? Well, I, I think you have to probably wonder, you know, and it's, it's a given now, I think that, you know, does, does somebody want to take a chance on, on a goal scorer and take Tara Sanko off their hands at the deadline. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, I think that there's, well, they know what their core is. Sure. It's a disappointment in Ottawa, but they know what their core is. And they know where they're going. Um, they're going to, and they're going to be stuck with a couple of guys, you know, and some of the contracts, maybe one of the goaltenders they're going to feel they're stuck with. Um, but I'm, I'm prepared to give Steve and Davey Poole and, the rest of the year to figure out what it, what the heck's going on um, and hope for better things in October for Ottawa. It's disappointing for yeah. Ottawa fans, but I, I think that, well, you know, this is a franchise on hold for another year, Matt. And also the uh, interesting that the insiders were using the word professionals. He's looking to bring professionals in that suggests there might be a culture change to come in there. Um, well, yeah, but, but here, it, it just, I know we got to go, but here's one thing, one thing I think we, and we might've talked about this early in the year, Brady Kachuk can't be a captain and be as emotional as he is. Someone has to be a guiding hand to their young stars and young leaders to say, hey, you don't act like that. You know, that was what Mark Messier did in New York when he showed up there, was half of what he did was score goals and you know, be a physical presence on the ice. The other half was saying, boys, we're the New York Rangers. We don't act that way. We act this way. Every team needs a little bit of that type of player. And right now, Ottawa appears, based on what, as you mentioned, and what, what uh, Darren and, and Pierre and all the guys have talked about, is they don't have anybody to say, calm down, boys, we're going to be okay. This is how we act as members of the Ottawa Senators Hockey Club. Great stuff, John. Wonder, uh, we will catch up a week from now. Thank you. Cheers, boys. This is Harrison Price clip brought to you by Applewood Auto Group. And remember, it's all good at Applewood.